And you take care of your people, they're going to take care of you. A lot of my guys make me look like a fucking rock star. I make a lot of mistakes, but these guys always pick me up somehow. And that's what I love about them. And I will go to the moon and back. I tell them all the time, if you are making the right decision in your question, I will back you 100%. If you make a shit decision, there's nothing I can do. If you make a terrible decision, I can't help you, especially if you lie about it. If you're not upfront and honest when you make a mistake, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go sideways for you, man. But if you're making the right decisions and your question, 100%, I will always be, be behind you and back you up. All right. Hey, what's up, everybody? Relentless Rejects podcast, episode 36. Thank you once again for tuning in. We're coming up toward the end of the year, and it has been a hell of a ride. This has been a hell of year one. The podcast is doing much better than I thought. I thought, you know, the one viewer that actually watches this thing was going to stop watching, but we've picked up some steam, and I appreciate everyone that listens. My guest today is Steve Stewie Stowecki. Am I staying Stowecki right? You are. Yes, you are. Thank you. See, I knew it. I was practicing. I was practicing in the mirror. <laughs> I love it. Um, fellow vigilante, been on the scrap uh, over on the East Coast. I, it's always weird when I mess with or, or message guys that are on different time zones. And you you message me today and you're like, hey, are we doing three o'clock my time or your time? And I'm like, I don't know. I got to look at it. <laughs> oh, man. But that's the majority of people I have on, on the show is it's hardly anyone in my time zone. It's, it's of difficult course, right? to manage. Yeah. We're just dumb firemen, dude. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm in my own jurisdictional bubble. Don't right? ask me what time zone. Yeah. I actually benefited from being, uh, for being in the Navy. I was stationed in Japan for four years. Oh, no kidding. Not, not by choice. <laughs> it was one of those things where I joined the Navy and I was 18 years old and they're like, oh, you have no wife. You have no kids. Uh, you basically have nobody that's going to miss you. So we're just going to send you to Japan. Right. Enjoy. Yeah. You go to that line was, over there. And I was, just, I was just a punk kid from LA at the time. So I didn't know any better. I was, it was, they were right. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't have anybody to write letters home to. It was just whatever. So yeah. So that time zone, as you can imagine, I think it's like 14 or 15 hours oh, wow. ahead. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's brutal. So yeah, yeah. We're try like watching, couple... try so watching we're the like... world series at like eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right. Yeah, man. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. I can't appre uh, thank you enough and appreciate you having me on. Super excited. I got to thank you, though, uh, on a serious note. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and stuff like that. Of course, the Scrap and some other ones. I think from episode three is where I found you. Went back, watched one and two, and I haven't missed one yet. What you and uh, your... No, <laughs> seriously. Uh, you guys have motivated me so much, um, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, everything from the everyday stuff, being positive. Uh, but on an, another note, I'm, I'm throwing your demographics off because everyone I think you've had on have arms like this big and mine are like <laughs> this big. But fitness wise, like I'm dead yeah. serious. Since I really dove into your podcast, I have really been watching what I eat, working out more than uh, I have been in the past, even to a point I have a local guy here at uh, another department. He's one of those guys that you should have on. Like, again, his arms are like this big. Um, contacting him. He's got his own uh, business, side business, a whole, whole gym. So I'm going to see him to do some, uh, some more workouts and stuff like that. So again, I want to thank you for what you're doing and motivating a lot of people. Um, you probably don't even know about it, uh, but you're doing an awesome job, man. I can't thank you enough for having me on. Well, well, I appreciate you for the kudos. And honestly, when I started this, I didn't think about that kind of stuff. You know, uh, you've heard me say it on the episode, like anybody, everybody that comes on, I, I, I hope to steal nuggets from them, right? The impact that they're making in the fire service. I'm just, I use it to, for them to tell the story. So hopefully it rubs off on me. And, mm -hmm. and like, you're saying it has rubbed off on you. Oh yeah. I, I've like, I've had, I don't know how many smoke divers on this podcast. <laughs> I mean, Noah Katz is dropping this week. So that's a plus one, but like, yeah, Marco, Slogan, Broberg, all these guys, and even guys that aren't smoke divers, but John Spira, like amazing. Right. For being. sure. I don't know how I've gotten them on the show. So if you're looking for a secret on how to network with these guys, I don't know. <laughs> right. I think you just make a cool logo, put it on Instagram, and then people are like, oh, this guy's legit. And right. No, there you go. Oh, not. he's a firefighter. <laughs> yeah. I, and I appreciate that, man. And, and and I'm actually I'm actually going through that same journey. Um, and you've heard me talk about Marcos is not yeah. far from me. There's a difference between critics and haters, right? Mm -hmm. Haters are people that don't want to see you win. 
they talk shit to you behind your back or whatever. And just because they don't like you for whatever reason, yeah. or they just don't like what you're doing. Marcos, on the other hand, wants to see me win, but he will tell me to my face, like, Hey bro, like you better start putting in the work. Yeah. You can't just talk this talk and over here, not putting in the work. And I'm like, all right, brother. So there's not a, there's not a week that goes by where I'm not in my gear, sweating it out. I'm not doing hard knocks heavy. Like he is. I mean, he's right. got 15 plus years of training in gear, but you know, I'm working my way up there too, man. So I'm on the same journey. Yeah. Just listening to uh, his podcast with you and then somebody else. I was sweating just listening to it. I'm like, these guys Jeez. are crazy. Yeah. I tell you what, if you, if, if anybody like watches the video and watches my face on that, you can like literally see imposter syndrome just <laughs> all over my face, you know, because I did bro lifting all my entire life, right? I was a dumb jock in high school. I played football, ran track. And then in, in the Navy, you know, I, I was probably really good at beer pong and just like Right. bar sports yeah yeah. you yep. know and it just i got in the weight room and got the, worked on the biceps and the chest and you know, legs once a month right right no i get it man you know? I get it. so uh yeah so the fire service and having guests and having this platform has really helped keep me accountable as well and it's awesome it's man. an awesome thing that i also one another thing that i didn't anticipate right but i i truly believe though when you have a platform or you put yourself out there like you were on the scrap and i'm sure the same thing happened to you when you're on the scrap you're like I have to make sure that I'm backing up everything that I say. Yeah. And, but, but still be humble enough to be like, look, I say these things and I try to walk by them every day, but I'm not a perfect human being. Like, there's no. days where I suck and that's oh, perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah. I tell everybody that the, the few successes I've had in life and, you know, in the fire service have come all from my mistakes. You know what I mean? And, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are afraid to make mistakes and they hide behind things, you know, and it drives me nuts. Related to the fire service, you know, we have a, a beautiful training tower, class A building, all that fun stuff. We host uh, a Great Lakes Hot, uh, Great Lakes Hot, one of the uh, one of the tracks. But, you know, that's where we're, we're going to fail. We're throwing ladders the other day, you know, we're pulling out the 24s and stuff like that. And, you know, with my new role as a ship commander, you know, I'm not always throwing those ladders anymore. And I find that I have to step up my game because the days that we don't have staffing and I'm on the truck or, you know, I'm, I'm curbside watching things go on. Maybe it's something somebody missed or I missed where I can go grab that ladder, whether it's 24, uh, 24, 28, you know, and it's still got to get up. So mm -hmm. that's a struggle that I have. You know what I mean? That I have to, you know, remind myself continually that I need to step up my game a little bit more. Yeah, and it doesn't get easier the older you get, right? It's I'll, uh, I'll be forty nine uh, next month, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, but that's you. Something that you realize is that yeah. you're in the job. It doesn't matter your age. There's going to be a demand for you on the mm -hmm. fire ground, and you have to perform. Whether you're in training, whether you're an admin, it doesn't yep. matter. Like you're still a part of the service. This is something that you should be able to do. Oh, absolutely. If you have a set of gear. At any point, you can be thrown into, you know, any kind of situation and you have to yeah. be ready for it. You have to. For sure. You have to take a few minutes. I know you guys have talked about it numerous times, you know, your, your training exercise, your drill, if you want to call it that, on a daily basis doesn't have to be an hour or two. You can spend 25 minutes, you know, throwing a ladder. You can spend 10 minutes masking up with your gloves. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't mm -hmm. always have to be some massive, you know, live fire scenario. I think a lot of people miss that because when they hear, hear the word drill or training, and they get all bent out of shape and go, oh, here we go again. But again, it can be yeah. a short, you know, 20, 30 minute, small little exercise that's going to make you better. Yeah. And, and what people don't realize though, too, with like training the basics is there's levels just to the basics. Yeah. Uh, I remember a training where I was the, I was the driver for the day. I was the engineer and I'm like, cool. I set the thing in pump. They pulled the hose and I set the GPMs to where they needed to be. And I like was just standing there. In the front, and and one of the cadre, the, one of the instructors that day was like, "Hey man, what if they call a mayday right now? And you're the first new engine, and no one's here." And I'm like, "Well, I don't know." And he's like, "Okay, well maybe you should put your gear on and stand by the front door since your job is done, and be and be be an, an extra body to either hump hose or to help receive a victim or any of that." And I'm like, "Well, shit." And that's just the basics, right? Hey, yep. set the pump pull the hose, go to the front door, put the fire out, find the victim, pull the victim out. It was just one of those scenarios. It was nothing complex. But someone came up to me and they were like, hey man, let's think next level on this. So funny you say that. That actually happened to me. So back in 2011 or 12 was my first promotion. Um, we have sergeants within our department and I got promoted to sergeant. 
And uh, we're at the station, and two of my buddies were there who were also sergeants. They were from about a year or two ahead of me. And we had one other guy, and a structure fire comes in. So my two friends are laughing. They're like, hey, you want the red helmet? <laughs> there you go. Front right, buddy. And I'm like, wait a second. You know, I'm, I'm going in the back. And they're like, absolutely not. You know, your IC. Long story short, we get there. It was a modular home. Other units were en route. As soon as we hit the parking brake, boots on the ground, guy from the park comes running up and says, hey, there's a kid in there. He, he's still in there. So instantly, my two are headed in. Driver's up, pulling the line. He's starting to get a, a hydrant. I'm doing my 360. And I get back to the Alpha side. And this is all within you know, a few minutes. It's mm -hmm. mayday, mayday, mayday. And you want to talk about your heart sinking. Not only, you know, I, two or three weeks, you know, as an officer, you know, well, two of my good friends, one very close, you know, I look left, look right. There's still nobody there, you know, call me on the radio. And the first thing I can think of is I'm going right to the front door, right to their point of entry. And all I can do is, you know, start calling out, you know, try and get in that building a little bit, you know, lock my legs around the, the door because we had some heavy smoke and heavy fire. And by the grace of God, by the time I got to the steps, they came running out. So essentially, the ceiling collapsed on them while mm -hmm. they were in there. The ceiling took off uh, the mask of one of my guys. He was able to put the mask back on. They were somewhat near the door. They were able to get out, uh, went back in. As they went back in the search, family shows up and said, everyone's clear. So we, we dodged a bullet mm -hmm. with that. But again, to your point, you just never know what can happen. Yeah. No, it's uh, staying hyper vigilant and being always ready for that worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, you can do that with the basics. That's that's oh, all. That's all I'm saying. And another thing with mastering the basics, once again, is like before I started getting real comfortable and just wrapping things out, being comfortable just doing things by myself. Right? You, like you don't need your whole crew to do stuff with you in your training. But on a real fire ground, when someone calls for a ladder, before I was just throwing ladders just to be good at it. Every time someone would call for a ladder on a real fire ground, I like had this like uneasy feeling mm -hmm. of like being afraid to drop it or not or, like fearing that I'm going to like not be able to successfully throw the ladder. Right. And that's just because I wasn't mastering the basics. Right. But then once you master, you do that monotonous crap on the fire ground or the drill ground. Right. I call right. it crap just to emphasize the fact that when you when it becomes so boring and you have to do it in real life, it's like it's not it's no sweat off your back. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's just, you know, one at a time. You know what I mean? Just take it one at a time. And if you mm -hmm. do the little things every day, it's funny because uh, down in Pensacola this past summer at Water on the Fire, we were at um, Sidelines, if you're familiar with that small little restaurant bar. Mm -hmm. We're sitting there and there were five, six, seven guys behind us. One of them is on the CFT team. I've seen him every time I've been down there. I don't know his name. I know his face. I've gone through pictures looking for this guy. But he was telling these other people at the table every day on his shift. And I want to say he works for Scambia County. I don't know if it, I, if it was their station or if it's Italian-wide or whatever. They spend uh, a short amount of time every day pulling line, masking up, and I think it was throwing a ladder. And I want to verify that with him. It was those three things. And between the four of them, I think, in the firehouse, because I think he's – I thought I heard him say it was a single-engine uh, house. It'll take 20 to 25 minutes. Well, they do have extra training, obviously, you know, for, you know, department-wide, but every day, that's what they do. And I'm like, it's freaking genius. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're not killing yourself. You know, you're getting to know your ladder a little bit better. My environment's going to change here quite a bit, as is yours in the next month or two because of the weather. So you bring in that snow. You bring in that ice, that slush, the freezing cold wind, you know, in the middle of January. It completely changes everything, you know? Mm -hmm. It just, again, it's, it's those things that you do every day, just a little bit at a time that makes you a little bit better every day. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I have a company officer, a good friend of mine, he calls them layups. So he's like, at the beginning of the shift, that's what we're going to do. We're going to pull a hose. We're going to force a door and we're going to throw ladders. That's his three things. Mm -hmm. And he says, if we cannot, for whatever reason, call volume, master calendar, Cannot get any other training in throughout the day. At least we've checked right. the boxes on these things. Right. You know, I mean, and, and that makes that makes you feel a lot better because there are times as company officer, you're like, man, I got this great search drill, drags and carries. I got a scenario planned out in my head. It's We're going to knock it out. Two o'clock this afternoon after lunch, we're going to knock it out. And then you don't see the station until 10 p.m. Right. It's, like, it's just one of those days, you know, and you're like, well, shit, I lost, I lost my training opportunity. But if you're right. doing your layups, 
doing your yep. layups, just like in basketball, right? Boop, just right. easy layups. It uh, at least makes you feel better that you got something done. No, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And again, it only takes a few minutes. For sure. Yeah, as long as everybody's involved, right? If you're right. pulling a hose by yourself and then you got to rack the hose by yourself, that sucks. <laughs> um, all right, we broke one of my rules. And I already told you at the beginning that we were going to do family first, but then we oh, already <laughs> took a deep dive into some awesome, awesome culture and topics and training. And please, uh, please humble me and uh, just do me, give me a shout out or acknowledge any family members that you want to give the opportunity to acknowledge because we are nothing without our families. And I truly believe that. Yeah, for sure. Definitely my wife, uh, Jeannie, love her to death. She is the, uh, the glue that keeps this shit show together. That's for sure. Definitely, uh, you know, my sons, uh, Nate, uh, Brendan, and Cameron, and uh, my parents, of course, who, uh, who have always been. Man, quick and easy right yeah, out of the gate, huh? Yeah, I got a really good family, man. I love them. Yeah. Is, uh, and how long have you been married? Uh, you know, funny. So we've actually only been married uh, a little over a year. Uh, our okay. good friend Todd Edwards actually married us on the beach in Pensacola. I know that guy. Yeah. A year ago, but we've been together for uh, quite a long time. So I just decided finally to, uh, to actually do it. Was that, was that your idea or her idea or family pressure? You know, it's funny. Like we were talking before, you know, we started recording um, what we call our uh, quality time together. Hmm. So it can be anything from a walk in the neighborhood to a fancy dinner. Um, a lot of times because we're so hectic and sports is such a big thing in our family, specifically baseball. Sometimes our quality time is running up to the the, uh, the pub around the corner, which is about a quarter mile from our house. Ironically, it's called the Firehouse Pub. And they got all these, you know, fire crap in here. Uh, from what I understand, the original firehouse was owned by a couple of Detroit guys and then has since sold, but they kind of keep it. But the entire wedding was uh, written out on a cocktail napkin sitting at the bar. Like, uh, th hey, wow. I think we should do this. It, it was hilarious. In about 35 minutes, we had everything kind of planned out. Uh, our original plan was to go to, you know, the Caribbean or something like that. And my parents are older. Uh, my dad will be 84 in a couple of weeks. My mom just turned 80. They had to be there, even though we wanted just the two of us, you know, and, like, the boys got to go and all that fun stuff so, out of the grace of nowhere. You know what I mean? Oh, God, I just said, hey, what about Pensacola? And she kind of looked at me. She's like, are you kidding me? I'm like, 400 of our closest friends can be there. She's like, I'm not getting married with all your, you know, uh, fire buddies. Fire That's buddies. it. And then <laughs> as like, we're kind of like talking about it and she's kind of buying into it. We're thinking about like a venue to do. So I text Todd and I said, hey, this is what's going on. It's what we're thinking. Can you give me a couple nicer places in the Pensacola area that we could have, you know, a small wedding and reception? There's going to be 20 to 25 of us immediate family. And he's like, yeah, X, Y, and Z. By the way, did you know I'm a minister? And I <laughs> look at my genie. I said, hey, Todd can marry us. Absolutely not. <laughs> this is not going to happen. And then after a few conversations, she definitely bought into it. And uh, nice. we would, wouldn't change a thing, man. It was awesome. What venue did you choose? Oh, we actually, it was on the beach. Okay. Right outside the uh, the hotel. And then uh, we had uh, essentially a small brunch right after in the hotel next to the Hilton because all the rooms for the conference were being, were being used to Hilton. Uh, it was during the conference? It was uh, Sunday before the conference started. So, oh my goodness. Yeah, it was pretty cool, man. And then, uh, yeah. you know, we had a nice little brunch. It was nothing crazy. We hit the beach. And then we took everybody out for dinner uh, that night. So nice. Have you ever been to the fish house on the main side? I have not. Oh man, that's my favorite place. Cause I was no stationed kidding. in Pensacola for two and a half years before well, I got out of the Navy. And that's why I love going to CFT conferences. But yeah, there's a place called the fish house. Uh, it's, it's, it's outside of downtown a little bit, but it's, it's, okay. it's a nice place. The next time you go out there, you should check it out. Oh, for sure, man. For sure. It's a good spot when you want to get away, just have like take the spouse away from the debauchery for a night. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. That, and I love, and I know we're going to dive deep into Pensacola because that was, that's one of my favorite places in the oh, world. For sure. But let's talk about just a little bit about your journey into the fire service. Uh, how'd you get in the fire service? Uh, what was your reason to get to joining? Well, it's funny. Um, I've always wanted to go into public service. And growing up, I thought I was going to be a cop, to be honest with you. It was my lifelong dream. Graduated high school, um, got into floor covering. It was just a job. 30 years later, by the way, I'm still in it. Uh, and then I started taking courses at the local community college and then just got really busy with work. Started working for a friend of the family who I called my uncle and kind of pushed it away uh, for a while. One of my good buddies also worked with us in flooring 
went into the fire academy, started working. So he had been working probably about two years. And every day, you know, we're working together. He's telling me about all this cool training he's doing and these fires and these car accidents and all this fun stuff. And finally, one day, I'm like, hey, would you be upset if I went to the fire academy? Because it sounds really cool. He said, are you kidding me, man? Absolutely. He sends me all the information. And uh, long story short, you know, I ended up kind of where I'm at. Nice. It's funny because I'm not a big guy. I'm five six, you know, soaking or uh, five six, depending on the day in the shoes, and 160 pounds soaking wet. So my childhood friends, they laughed at. Me. I mean, they literally laughed at me when I told them I'm going to the fire service. And that's one of my biggest mo- motivations: is tell me you can. Because all my life I was, I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't fast enough, I wasn't this, I wasn't that. Tell me I can't, and I'll tell you what. Every time you tell me that, I'm going to excel at everything that mm-hmm. I do. Yeah, it was a good I, motivator. And uh, yeah, yeah, again, 24 years later, here I am. I, I love the people that, that give you that extra energy, that, that reason, oh, yeah. right? You being a small guy, a lighter guy, and people telling you you can't do it. Yep. Oh, yeah. That's what I think. Thank you so much, because that is all I needed to show you that I can. Absolutely. You, yeah. you know, it's funny, even when I was a firefighter, you know, you'd go in for a search drill or whatever it might be. And you know, the uh, instructor would throw all of a sudden a down firefighter or a victim or something like that. And everybody has their different ways of dragging somebody out. And here I am, my little ass, you know, dragging people out. I'm not the guy that's going to put them over your shoulder and run out. You know, your stereotypical, you know, Hollywood, you know, firefighter. Yeah. I have to use different techniques because of my body stature, you know. And that's it. Again, like we were talking earlier, just because I put my right shoe you know, or my right foot and my right shoe first doesn't mean it's always right. Got to figure out what's going to work for you. Mm. Yeah, man. But you know what? I, the guys like John Sparrow are not big either. And he's right. got the biggest heart, one of the biggest influences in the fire service. So and that, that's uh, it's it. Not, it's yeah, your... not the size. And you need, you need different size firefighters. You know what I mean? Because I bet, correct me if I'm wrong, I bet they try to use you as a victim all the time <laughs> in training. For sure. For sure. <laughs> They're like, yeah, we're gonna, let's do a live victim this time. You know what I mean? Because their mannequins suck and X, Y, and Z. And everyone's like, still here yet. What's well, funny? It's like, <laughs> now I wear a white shirt. And I'm like, nope. Oh, uh, that's funny. I've been dropped too many times. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what year did you join? Uh, I started in 2000. Um, 2000? So basically I graduated uh, and 9-11 happened uh, a few months after. So yeah, man, you want to talk Change about the game. Uh, it did. It, it really did. Um, you know, those type of incidents were never really thought of, you know, um, back then, you know, the terrorist activities, and you know, were not a part of the, the fire service in my realm, you know, that I can speak about. And uh, in our area, you know, no one has ever talked about something like that. So it, it happens and you're like, oh, my God, like, this is big. Can they send us that far south to you know, the bigger cities and stuff like that? And it was definitely yeah. an eye opener. That's for sure. Yeah, I think Frank Fascuso talks about after 9-11, that's when we really became an all-hazards type organization. Oh, I, yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for I don't sure. know I don't know why. Like, we just started picking up the bill for everybody, like, when it came to hazmat, tech rescue, and active shooter, and all this stuff. It's like the fire department, the fire department, the fire department. Well, you get uh, the nail on the head, active shooter. I mean, yeah. back in 2000, 2000, early 2000s, if you told me that we were going to be going in, in, into these places of business, sanctuaries, whatever it might be, on an active shooter situation, would have left in your face. That's not yeah. my job, right? No. And now again, we're the we're the uh, problem solvers of of the world. Essentially, it feels like sometimes, you know. Yeah, and especially out here in Colorado, we uh, we practice unfortunately those scenarios a lot. And I was mm-hmm. I was actually just on a active shooter. It wasn't a, like mass casualty active shooter. It was just mm-hmm. a crazy dude like shooting outside of his house. But it's a it's weird. It didn't even hit me. We pull up, we're down the street, pull up the house on Google Maps. I'm like, all right, this is where we're going to stage. Mm-hmm. We get out of the thing, and I'm just wearing a t-shirt, right? We have all the ballistics and stuff. But all I've ever done was training. I get out, and, the, and you hear the rounds, just flop, 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 flop. <laughs> and then two, two cops, actually, one caught one in the shoulder, another one caught just shrapnel. So I'm like, shit, this got real no really kidding. fast. We had to put our ballistics on and then we went straight into RTF mode and right. and the, the cops at that point were not messing around. There was SWAT teams from like five different counties that descended mm-hmm. upon the neighborhood we were at. That was impressive. I That's will crazy. tip my hat to the cops for that. They're badass. That's crazy, man. Yeah, but it is crazy to think, oh, I'm a firefighter. Well, what the fuck am I doing on an active shooter call? Right. That's, just, right. that's what we do now. 
What, that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, man. So I asked you this uh, before we st- we hit the record button because I I'm always curious. At what point in your career did like that spark hit you? I don't. I'm, if you got into it, great. Or got in the fire service with that spark, great. But there's a point I think in everybody's career where they're like, man, the fire service is amazing. The brotherhood is outstanding, and I I'm so ate up about the fire service now. Like, was there a moment for you? That happened? There was. Um, I can't say it was a switch or anything like that. Um, growing up, what I, I'd say as a kid, when I say kid, not at, as an age, but young in the fire service, we had a really good core group that were together. And uh, we loved the brotherhood. We, you know, hang out at the station, stuff like that, coffee, you know, pull the, the rigs out on the bay when the weather's nice, stuff like that, and, you know, shoot the shit. But it was, uh, and John uh, lightly actually um, uh, mentioned it on, on his uh podcast i got burned in 06 uh and almost died and just for for the record there i'm sure there are hundreds and thousands of firefighters that have been worse scenarios than i have been mine wasn't super crazy but it was enough where uh i almost died so it was back in 06 february 06 i'll never forget it we had a string of fires and we had a string of traumas like all within you know, a month's time. And I was missing all the fires and I was getting all the traumas. And it was a Sunday afternoon. It was cold. We caught this fire for first two. All the guys are laughing like, you got the line, you got the line. And I'm like, heck, you know, hell yeah, I got the line. So we get there. It's a detached garage, essentially. It's a bullshit fire. I pull the line. I basically park myself between two cars with the building in front of me. And, you know, we're calling for water, stretch the line, waiting on water. Engineer had an issue with the pump. The doors on the garage were like sliders, like barn doors. So the guys in front of me actually just pulled them off because they were worried that they were going to fall toward me. So as soon as they pulled them off, I got hit with this heat. And the only way I can describe that heat is you throw a log or two on your bonfire and it gets a little hot and you pick up your chair, you know what I mean? You just kind of move back a little bit. So I kind of repositioned, still waiting on water. Finally got it, went in for the kill, put the fire out. So I'm walking out of the structure, and as I'm approaching the engine, the engineer looks at me, he's like, oh, my God, man, like, you're smoking. And I'm like, it's February, man. Like, <laughs> it's, of course, yeah, it's a hot environment, right? You know, in a cold environment. So I start taking off my, my equipment, and I'm about to take off my mask, and across the bridge of my nose was ice. I'm like, damn, man, it's really cold out here, you know? So I take off my mask and I look at it and my mask was melted. My regulator was melted. And I'm like, holy shit, like that, what the hell? My helmet, because at the time we had the visors, nothing was Mm. deteriorated, nothing was melted. It was just right here. And we're like, holy crap, that's weird. Take off my gloves and on my right hand, my middle finger and my ring finger, right at the knuckle was about marble sized blistering already. So you take it off, you're like, what the heck's going on here? You know what I mean? Like, start getting a little nervous and stuff like that. Go over to the instant commander. I'm like, hey, this is what's going on. He's like, hey, we'll walk you over to the ambulance. So I get over to the ambulance. I got my pants, my bunker pants still on. And like, hey, I want you to just take those off. We'll, you know, get you in the back of the ambulance. So as I'm taking off my pants, my left leg's hurting now. So sit on the stretcher in the ambulance. They cut my pant leg off. And I have about a baseball-sized blister on my knee. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? So then you start getting nervous, right? The adrenal- adrenaline's going, you know, am I having a hard time breathing? <laughs> Feels pressure in my chest. Is it just me? So long story short, I had secondary burns on my hands and my leg. We sent the pack to uh, the manufacturer. Uh, about three weeks later, we got the results back. And they said within another 15 seconds, I had I been still in that environment, my pack would have failed, essentially. So it grounds you, man. I mean, it, it really it grounds you. And again, there have been, I'm sure, hundreds and thousands of firefighters that have been worse scenarios sure. than I, I've ever been. But for me, in, in my world of this, you know, at the times, rather small department, it, uh, it hit home. Uh, my oldest son was only uh, nine months old, eight, nine, ten months old. You know, I couldn't even pick him up because both my hands were wrapped up because of blisters. I'm sorry, too. My left hand had a huge blister on it, too. I couldn't wipe my own ass. Like legit, mm. it was it was terrible. Uh, cost me nine to ten weeks on the job, and I was really angry. Uh, I was really angry. You, know, you want to talk about the critics? Everyone pointed the finger at me. You know, you shouldn't have been in the position you were. You should have been, you know, protecting the exposure. You should have been doing this. You should have been doing that. Why wasn't I told differently? 
And that was my thing. Nobody has trained me or taught me to do things differently. This is what we've always done. So how am I wrong? So I pointed the finger back at a lot of, a lot of people. And it took me a long time to realize that, you know what? It was my responsibility. I didn't know any better. Five or six years on the job, you know, I, I could have been chief at the time. Let me tell you, I knew everything. So that's what really fast forwarded me into training. Um, I'm still a training officer today um, of my department. Um, I've been a training officer for 12 years. Uh, I don't know if that's a blessing or, you know, or a curse. But once I came back, I sat down with a couple officers. At the time, he's now retired. He was our training officer. And we got to start talking tactics a little bit. And one conversation led to an article, which led to you know another article. And I came back to him and said, hey, I got this idea about a search training and opposed advancement training. And next thing you know, I'm really starting to help out. And I made it my goal still to this day that I don't care who it is. I don't want them ever to experience what I went through because we didn't know. You know, there was no why behind it. You know, in my department at the time, no one gave the why. And mm-hmm. I feel it. They kind of failed me. Absolutely. But I'll take responsibility, you know, being older now and you know, a little bit more mature. You know, I'll take responsibility I didn't know because I didn't take the time to read or train or anything like that other than our normal department training, you know. So I dive in everything. Uh, we have a size of uh, training coming up in the next two weeks or something like that. Preston, I had three books out yesterday and listened to a podcast. It's actually Todd Edwards. Uh, he and Anthony Rowett about size up on the first two engine, you know. Guys were walking in like, what are you doing? I got highlighters out. I got, you know, making the PowerPoint. And just to my point, you know, I do my homework now, like big time. So that was, for me, that was my huge motivator. And uh, I love training. I love everything about it. Uh, and I haven't turned back. I have not turned back. It's really cool to see that you took a situation that whether you made a mistake or whether you didn't have the proper training, whatever it was, you've turned it into a positive. Like you've gone into training and you're, you're one of your missions is to make sure no one ends up in that situation like Absolutely. you did, right? Like. Like you said, detached garage. Like, what the? F- why? Why are people getting burned on a detached garage? But it happens. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Looking at it now, I, I laugh and I'm like, our tactics have changed so much, you know, and we have grown so much and stuff like that. You know, there's ten things, you know, I would have done differently, you know, on that fire. You yeah. know, just thinking it right now. Um, but yeah, man, it's uh, it was it was me. It was it was the eye opener. It was the point in the right direction. Um, and again, it's been a hundred miles an hour, and I haven't let off the gas. Yeah. Uh, is is your position a permanent position now in training or can you come out anytime? What's that? I'm, like? Well, technically I'm still in line. We don't have 40 hour people for, uh, for that. Okay. Yeah. So what's nice though, with the three different shifts, I'm still the training officer, but I had each shift has a training coordinator. Even on my shift, I have a coordinator. So I'm overseeing everything for the most part. Uh, I still do my, my stuff. I do like it, uh, on occasion when, um, depending on what's going on and where I'm at as a shift commander, jumping in a, a drill. Uh, I love following a crew into the training tower, bumping somebody like, who the hell's that? Like, like it's a kid. <laughs> yeah. Love it. I'm the new guy. Yeah, my old shift used to call me the weasel because I, we, uh, I would weasel my way into everything. Yeah. Would you say, I mean, how has it been like being ate up about it? Like you said, listen to podcasts. You got different books. And I can tell you've, you've networked with a lot of amazing individuals yep. in the fire service outside yep. of your department. Mm-hmm. Is that rubbing off at all on certain people in your department? Or are you just known as that guy? It started off for a long time as that guy. It took me a long time to realize that a lot of people don't love the job the way I do. And, and that's okay. Yeah. In my personal opinion, you have three different groups within the fire department. You have guys that are there for a paycheck and a t-shirt. It is what it is. I don't think they're the majority. I think the majority are the people that really like the job. They might say they love it, but they go a little bit above and beyond. That's probably the majority. And then there's mm-hmm. the people that just truly love the job that sit here and talk shop, you know what I mean? And, and go to conferences and go to trainings. Yeah. Slowly over time, I have been able to influence people. A lot of people won't admit it, you know what I mean? Because they're afraid of ridicule. Like I've said before, you know, we're a baseball family and I've learned over the years that I'm not going to hit a home run. I'm just not. You got to go for the base hits. And a lot of times it's that one-on-one conversation, whether it's out in the bay, in your office, or sitting on a tailboard or coffee, excuse me, you start having these conversations and then you start to rub, rub off on people. Mm-hmm. And it's awesome. It's been even better with Great Lakes Hot here in southeastern Michigan, getting more people from my department and friends of mine, you know, in the area to that conference, because that's really opened the eyes of a lot of people, too. 
And as you know, you go once, you're hooked. Absolutely oh, yeah. hooked. You know what I mean? And you sit there and you look at your schedule and you look at your family life and you look at your bank account. You know, if your department's not sending you and you say, what can I go to this year? You know, because I'd really like to hit one. I don't know if I can make that one, you know. Yeah. Yes, you know. Yes. That's been the shitty thing about having this platform. <laughs> it's, uh, I, there's guys out in Florida and Texas and Michigan and, and on the West Coast, Pacific Northwest, and they're like, hey, are you coming up to this conference? Are you coming over to this conference? I'm like, bro, that's like a eight-hour flight for me from where you're at. You know, right, like, right. Maybe not that far, but it's just like, it's another, and it's another one of those things, have a one-year-old baby in your house. No, it's, of course. Uh, yep. Um, I struggle with that, and which is why I like talking about family so much. Mm-hmm. If people will listen to podcasts and are tired of me talking about family, it's become something important to me because I did not do it right early right. on. No, I was very selfish. Yep. This year alone, I think I went to like five conferences and then mm-hmm. three or four different outside trainings. I was gone a lot. And uh, that's not the best way to do it, especially when your your wife works and actually makes more money than you Mm -hmm. yeah it's really hard to justify hey this is for career development this is for me but your wife still makes more money than you so like shameless shameless plug there but uh you know it's 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 funny if you don't want me uh tagging along on that or adding on to it um i was the same way and and family i learned to feel the hard way uh because my old schedule the way we were operating you know before we went to 24 some years ago Mm -hmm. is if i was scheduled for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, even though it was afternoons, I wouldn't take the day off because I, I could have a few hours in the morning with the kids. And I, I remember them, you know, upset that I was leaving. And I always go back to that uh, movie, 13 Hours in Benghazi, toward the end when they're on the rooftop. I was giving myself something bigger, but that something bigger is gone now. I regret not taking those days off. And yeah. I regret not spending more time with my family. So as I started to grow my career and reaching out and going into these conferences, and I've been fortunate for FDIC and Firehouse and, you know, a, a, a bunch of others, it's to the point now that the family's coming with me. Mm-hmm. Our first year in Pensacola, I'm excited. My, my really good friend, uh, his name's Chris Gruner. He's my, my training coordinator on my shift. Uh, we found water on the fire. So we approach our significant others. You know, we're having dinner, drinks, like, hey, we found this kind of conference in Pensacola in August. Uh, it's only three days, you know, we'll fly in, we'll fly out. And the girl's are like, okay. <laughs> so you're going to go to Florida in August with a beat without us. No, <laughs> no. And every yeah. time we've gone, the family is gone. The, the kids mm-hmm. have gone. Uh, when Corley, I, I want to say it was his first year um, presenting, uh, at Water on the Fire. My my youngest son, who knows, and I, I know we'll touch on this in a little bit, he's like, hey, can I go see Corley, you know, I'll present for a little bit? So we're walking. Chief Ike walks by real quick. I'm like, hey, Chief, I, I know you're busy. Can yeah. you give me two minutes? Would you mind? My son and I know Corley, blah, blah, blah. Go, absolutely. And I even, you know, texted Corley to make sure it's cool with him. He's like, absolutely. He lasted about 20 minutes or so, but, you know, he wanted to see it and what it was all about. And, you know, for me, Every time I go somewhere now, it's, are you guys, can you come with us? Because I want you guys to be there with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good point, especially Pensacola, right? That's definitely the place that you bring your, you can convince your significant other into going with you. I could not talk my wife into going to Aurora, Illinois for firemanship this year. Oh yeah. She did not. She was like, there's nothing I don't think there's anything there that appeals to me. (laughs) You can get, she, I sell her on the beach. So we go to COBC every year. We've been mm-hmm. the past two years and then we're going again next year. Uh, we bring the baby. So uh, I got her sold on Pensacola, at least for COBC, but right. uh, nothing, nothing else yet that she's willing to go to. This past April, I was finally able to get my wife down to FDIC. So uh, I've been fortunate this year, if I go, which I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be my ninth or 10th year. Mm. She came down on Thursday. We go for the full package. You know, we're there all week hands-on and then you know going to the, the classroom portions she came down on thursday and if you don't know what a whacker is w-h-a-c-k-e-r urban uh-huh. dictionary it's great she walks up and she's like oh my god there's whackers everywhere i'm like tell me about it i'm like it's a great time and she's just like this is different i'm like absolutely it's all forms of life at fdic but yeah it was uh-huh. cool to have her down for a couple of days doing a meeting experience you know indianapolis and you know all the hoopla of of indy and fdic and stuff like that but yeah, man, I love it when they come with me. 
Yeah, I'm hoping uh, this becomes a thing because I also co-host uh, Tailboard Misfits with Firefighter Nation, right, yep. with John Velez. I'm hoping that Chief Rhodes invites us over to do a live podcast at FDIC this year. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I've, or not this year, next year. But I've because I've never been to FDIC. I, I've always felt that FDIC was for the big dogs. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like Chief Rhodes and Scott Thompson as a keynote speaker and all these. Right. I'm like, bro, that's for that's for like battalion chiefs and up which it can't be any farther than the truth right it's for it's, it's welcome for everybody but it's one of those things where i'm like this might be a little too overwhelming for me uh, i'm gonna save that one for later on in my career i'll tell you what man i absolutely love it the hands on tracks and i'm not digging on anybody i get more out of the eight hours than a four hour uh, it's fdic it's very rushed monday and tuesday andy starns and insight training who i've gotten to know uh, we hosted them uh, a few months ago uh, for our local community college they came in to train the trainer I first was introduced to them at Firehouse Expo, uh, their first year in Columbus, took their class. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, their knowledge of uh, thermal imaging cameras and the fire service and everything, leadership, and they're just dialed in. Uh, so at FDIC the following year, I'm like, hey, it's a four-hour class, but I'm going to take it. There was four rotations, and it's not uh, their fault. We got three out of the four rotations. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, if you can, I would take an eight-hour class over a four-hour class. I think you're going to get more out of it. Yeah. And then the rest of the week is is pretty much a blur. <laughs> I hear that they're changing. It is, man. Um, I hear they're changing the format this year. In years past, you know, if, if Preston, you're uh, speaking Wednesday at one o'clock, and mm -hmm. Scott Thompson's uh, speaking also at one o'clock, you know, those were the only times for the classes. So you kind of yeah. had to pick and choose your priorities of what you wanted to, yeah, because you know, really no one, through. Because yeah. no one's going to go listen to Chief Thompson if I'm talking. You know what I mean? So they got to make sure. What, well, the, I was that way when I originally first started going. I started taking classes, which I just thought were cool, but I couldn't bring them back to my department. But then I'm like, wait a second, nothing against, you know, Chief Thompson. I, I would love to have a conversation with him. And we're actually working to bring him here to Michigan with those smoke funds I was telling you about. But I can catch a lot of podcasts with him. You know what I mean? I can catch an interview, you know, here and there. If you're doing a class, I don't have that opportunity every day to, to see you. So for me, my point is I'm going to see that guy that, might not be selling out every class, which is okay, because I might not have the opportunity again. So I'd rather sit down, you know, and sit in that class. Plus, I'm a front row guy, or I try to be. I want to get there in front. I hate walking into a classroom and be stuck in the middle or in the mm. back when I can barely hear or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, that my vision. Yeah, absolutely. My vision's starting to go away, so I got to try to be at the front row too. And plus, I made a post about this a long time ago, man. I think I, think I told like a story about how in school, all the cool kids sat in the back, right? Mm -hmm. Their feet kicked up. They were hardly paying attention, spitballs, passing notes, all that stuff. But in the fire service, the cool kids are in the front row. Yeah. You got Kyle Romagus, Scott Thompson, all those guys up there uh, with their freaking iPads and, and textbooks and all that taking notes. They're in the front. Those are the cool kids now in the fire service. That's the big difference between how we were growing up versus yep. our profession now. Like it, you definitely want to be in the front row. But still, you see it though. When you walk into, a presentation and you're a little bit early you start to see the back seats fill up and i'm like oh, yeah. that was dumb i'm gonna go yep. up front yeah it's funny you know because i always look at some people and i go i wonder if they're here because they were told to yeah you know because there's some you know classes here in michigan again with those funds and stuff like that and i know people are there because they're voluntold to the people that want to learn and want to be there are going to be in the front row heck water on the fire man my buddy chris and i we get up early and we get down to the lobby you know at seven o'clock and, you know, try and sneak in the room to set, you know, our, our, our um, notebooks at a table. Uh, I'm not sure how it is at the COBC, but Water on the Fire is only the first three or four rows that have tables. And everything else behind yeah. that is just chairs. So we try and get a table uh, so we can take notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's cool. I mean, I, I, I love that about the conferences. I tell people all the time because we have Mile High Fire Conference out here in Denver. And there's a lot of young guys that just want to attend the hands-on. They're mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, I don't need to sit through the lectures. It's boring. And I'm like, dude, that's where the relationships are made. That's where the like the little valuable gold nuggets yeah. are passed down. Right. I mean, well, you can do a freaking eight hour forceful entry class in your own department. You know what I mean? Right. And, and pick up some stuff. And mm -hmm. but those lectures, those instructors that come from across the country, you're never going to be able to hear from them again. Right. Like take advantage of that. Go up there, shake their hands when they're done speaking and, and develop that relationship. Yeah, even sometimes, you know, you get into the classroom early enough, you know, and they're setting up, you know, sometimes they're a little nervous or, you know, waiting to get going and to break the ice and, you know, uh, to um, 
cool them down a little bit sometimes, they'll just start making small talk with you. You know, Corley's presentation at FDIC the other year, I'm sitting, uh, I got there early, I'm sitting in the front row, and uh, I hear a voice behind me, and turn around, it's Paul Combs. So, you know, he's a big, you know, Tiger fan and a Lions fan, and uh, we just started talking, you know, making small talk, and it was so cool. Corley came over, said hello, we took a couple pictures, you know what I mean? Just, just really cool. Yeah. Yeah, the Lions are on a tear this year, so. Absolutely, That's my man. Cool. Heck yeah. Yeah, we'll see. All the haters. We'll see how that turns out. Absolutely. Yep. You touched on it a little bit. I want to talk about this, man, because it's really cool. You talked about the uh, that smoke budget, like the fireworks fund yep. for the state and, and uh, how you've benefited a lot on your training and education. Is that just for your state specifically? Yes. So back in 2011, the former governor signed into law the sale of commercial fireworks. So essentially, a portion of the sales tax goes directly to the fire marshal's office. So every year he gets about $2 million. So out of all the counties between the lower and upper peninsula, each county right away gets $17,500. So after that is distributed, and again, there's certain hoops that you have to go through, and maybe hoops is the wrong word. Um, you have to be end first compliant. Um, you have to fill out surveys and stuff like that. You got to make sure all your required work is done before you get you know the money, which most counties you know do, and they're very good at it. But when that money comes back, there's still a balance. So that balance goes to it's also divvied up to the largest county number of residents, firefighters, uh, for the most part. Wayne County, where Detroit is, they get the most money typically, and it's about three hundred thousand dollars. Don't quote me on that. The county to our west. Uh, Oakland County, they get about $200,000. And my county, Macomb, we get about $100,000. So each county also has to have a county training committee chairperson. So I made the grand decision about a year and a half ago to take that spot. And it's awesome, man. It just, it, it's really cool. I'm saying that with all the sarcasm. <laughs> Got it. Um, but it's it's really neat. Every course listed in the state is uh, what they call a Q course. Where the Q came from, I, I'm not quite sure. But you could actually search it up, um, you know, at home and look and look through the library. And there's an extensive amount of classes in there. There's big names. There's no names. There's certification classes. So last year alone, my county got I think 113,000 that we were able to spend. Um, and this year, we're probably going to get I would say close to that from what I'm from what I'm hearing. But it's cool, man. We're we're so excited. We're funding, uh, it's really neat because Great Lakes Hot is now a Q course. So cool. this year we're um, going to fund 32 spots. There's 32 departments within my county. So to a certain extent, you know, every uh, department gets one spot. There are departments that don't use it. So we'll have extra spots. I'm fortunate because uh, my department hosts one of the tracks for Great Lakes Hot. So instead, my chief says, you know, instead of us charging you for use of the tower, give me five spots. So we get five for free, so that opens up some more spots and stuff like that. So, and we spend fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars on that alone. So it's really cool, man. It's an awesome thing. Um, this year, um, again, we'll probably be around one ten, one thirteen. Our list of classes that we want to fund is already at one hundred and thirty. So we have a meeting next week. Where we're going to have to try and you know negate some of that. But certification classes, of course, is always going to be up there because the contracts are here, you know, in, in Michigan, which is fine. Instructor classes, you know, we have to fund. Um, but we're making a push to do some mental health classes because it's it, it's a need. We haven't done uh, any of those in a couple of years. Again, Great Lakes hot. Uh, we got some extrication classes. I have emails out for Rob Backer, uh, who I know is kind of in oh, your neighborhood for the most part. Right next door. Yeah, we brought him in last year. and. Mm -hmm. He wasn't halfway through his presentation. We were taking a break, and I was approached by other people and say, we want him back next year and potentially two classes instead of one this time. I have an email out to uh, Chief Scott Thompson and then Chief Ike. So I'm not sure exactly what we're going to fund yet. It's a group decision. It's not just me, uh, but it's an awesome, awesome, awesome program to have. Mm -hmm. You in Colorado, if you had a uh, forceful entry class, let's say, you can submit a, you know, a form with all your outline and costs and everything. And as long as you hit the check boxes, you know, it can be approved. So I've reached out to the people I have in my small role backs recently over the last few months and said, hey, listen, I need you to submit these classes. The next training council, training council, firefighter training council meeting is the first weekend in December up in Traverse City where there's a instructor conference. I will be there, but I need you to have it in for November 15th if you want to do a class here, you know, in the next fiscal year. So hopefully these gentlemen, you know, will uh, submit if they haven't already and uh, we can add more classes, you know, to the Q course catalog. 
Yeah. Man, that's that's awesome. I wish uh, we had something like that in the state. I don't know if we could try to figure out a way to piggyback on that and just right. You know what? I'll call the governor. I'll call the governor when we get out of here. Start with uh, your fire marshal. See what. Uh, All see right. What... You know, you know, Colorado does not do fire marshals. Oh, I did not know that. No, I I, I don't know, know what entity they use specifically for the state, but you okay. know, we basically just have a chief of fire prevention for our department. Okay. There's no like, yeah, fire marshal. So. I got to figure that out. We do a lot of grant writing. That's kind of where we do a lot of mm -hmm. our, our funding as well. So I don't know. It might just be in that space, the grant writer's realm, yeah, which I'll is tell super you, like, sexy, super it's, sexy. It's an awesome, awesome program that we have. And uh, again, there's just, you know, a ton of different classes in there and stuff like that. Uh, you can submit them at, at any time. I have an engine class in there and I have a rear class in there. And, you know, a couple times a year, you know, someone gives us a call and we're able to, uh, you know, uh, go travel a little bit and have some fun and do some learning and stuff like that. But it, it's, it's pretty badass. Wait, have you, have you taught, uh, yeah. on the road mm -hmm. engine and Rick in, classes? In, yeah. In the state of Michigan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Cause, uh, you, when you guys were talking, you and John, I don't remember if you piggybacked on Corley's, um, VES or, uh, the, uh, engine and the nozzle. And he, he said nozzle. And I, I don't remember yeah. exactly how you guys brought it up. But again, like we were talking earlier, I'm on a job site. I'm like, Hell yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We said, and that it's funny because if we go down a rabbit hole, we did a nozzle, hose and nozzle study a few years ago. And it was down at a firehouse when it was in Nashville, Tennessee, some years ago, pre COVID. Uh, I'm taking an engine class because, again, I was taking all these classes at these conferences that I just thought were cool. I fire, you know, and all this other cool stuff, but couldn't bring it back to my department. It just wasn't in our realm, you know. But hose and nozzle was something that I was really interested in because. Our bread and butter is residential structure fires. You know, again, we're the fastest growing state in the township. We have 14 brand new subdivisions that, subdivisions that are being developed as we speak. We're 36 square miles, four stations, and about 100,000 residents running 20 to 21, uh, 21 a day. We're pretty, we're pretty busy. But when they started talking about those nozzles, I, in my first rotation of this engine class, I meet John Hall, uh, Rick Mosier and uh, this guy named Andy Plufkin from uh, Elkhart Brass, who is now one of my really good friends. And uh, they start talking about nozzle. Like, what do you got? Uh, I can fog nozzle. What brand? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> is it fixed gallons or adjustable? Adjustable? Well, do you twist it? Yeah, I twist it because, you know, it says like 120, 150, and I think like 30 or something like that. Well, what's your pump uh, discharge presser? Yep. Uh, mode, pre yeah, mode preset. You didn't know what you didn't know. And it goes yep. back to, you know, not knowing. That's the majority of firefighters, though, too. It's crazy. So then yep. we started talking about smooth bores, and I'm like, smooth bore? I'm like, I've seen one of those in a magazine, but I've never never had one, right? Why isn't there a pistol grip on this thing? I'm going to, my little ass is going to lose this. I, I can't hold this. It's going to slip out of my hands. So as the day progresses, you know what I mean? I'm just, I, I got a thousand questions. And then after lunch, we go into the two and a half, right? Well, my realm at the time, a two and a half sat on the ground, right? And we only brought it out for the massive fire that, you know, right. we were going to have a commercial building. So the guy's like, yeah, we're going to put the smooth board on it. And by the end of the day, you're going to be holding this thing by yourself. And I'm like, I'm going to go flying across the parking lot. Like, <laughs> I'm going to have to sit up against a brick building or someone's got to stand behind me. So, um... I meet one of the other guys, and uh, we're sitting there talking. I tell him my concerns, jokingly, but kind of serious, you know. And uh, he's like, it's all technique, man. I'm going to show you how to do it. So we're sitting there, and uh, we start going through it. And uh, we're talking. Next thing you know, he's standing next to me. I'm like, well, who the hell is behind me? He's like, nobody. He's like, it's all technique, my man. He's yeah. like, you can do this. So I came back to the department, and I'm like, hey, you know, we need to change some things up. We need some new nozzles. We're over 20 years old, you know, anyway, X, Y, and Z. This went on for two years. You would have thought, you know, I wanted to change the world trying to bring a smooth war into, uh, into the department, but it was awesome, man. So we actually find it, uh, finally uh, switched things up. Uh, we went with Elkar Breast because they were the company that came out and actually educated us. Uh, we had some other brands out. They essentially pulled into our training tower, opened up the back of their pickup, and sat there. Literally didn't really talk to us. And hmm. It doesn't matter who it is, but Elkar just went above and beyond. And uh, that's where my love affair for Andy uh, Plufkin and uh, Mike Caesar and uh, Steve Meekoff from uh, from Elkhart uh, began. But they spent time with us and they educated us. And we realized quickly too that, you know, you want this new nozzle, but you're 
hose actually has to match that nozzle too because we had high pressure. You know, we had Akron 1763 adjustable gallons. You know, when they say 100 PSI at the tip, they mean, you know, at the nozzle. But if my PDP at 200 feet that way is 100, my, I'm not 100 here, am I? Oh, no. And then you really start flowing, you know, 100 PSI at the tip, and it's a two, three-man line. So once mm-hmm. you start going into low pressures and stuff like that, you realize, hey, this is a one-person line. Same with the two and a half. And now we went actually went to two and a quarter as an attack line, too, with an inch and an eighth on the tip. And that thing, I, I absolutely love it. Any kind of bigger fire, you know, we'll pull it or I'll have the guys pull it. I had a guy not too long ago go, can I take this inside? <laughs> Hell yeah, you can. Go for it, can Yeah, we're looking at two and a quarters as well. We got a guy that's uh, on our hose, hose committee. We yep. have a committee. We have a committee for committees in yep. my department. But the hose committee, we're looking at that two and a, uh, two and a quarter. I'll tell you what, if you're going to look two and a quarter, play with the two inch also. Because uh, there's a part of us that really worked with it, kind of kick ourselves in the ass for not really diving into the two inch also. So take a look at both yeah. of them. Do you know Jonathan Brumley? He's a I know Denver him, I've, Yeah, I've never personally met him, but I know of him. Yeah. I've seen him a couple times. He's not a big dude either. He's yeah. like five seven. 160 pounds. Yep. Uh, fit dude, but mm-hmm. not big. He can dance with the two yep. and a half inch. Uh, that's it's his, all, that's his thing. Yeah. It's all technique, man. And, and that's mm-hmm. the, the thing that you, you have to learn. A, so you have to have an open mind, right? Mm-hmm. And once you have that open mind and are willing to put the time in to actually physically work with the line or anything else, you know, you're going to win. It goes back to the base hits, man. You, you hit a base hit, eventually you get a double. At some point you get a triple. And every now and then you're gonna hit a hit a home run, yeah. but it's just work taking the time to work with the line, or able to maneuver it. You're good to go, man, and put the water where it needs to go. That's the other thing too. Yeah, but not to mow over the fact that you said it's a like a two year journey. It's oh, not man. something you just bring to your department. And I'm like, Mm-mm. this is gonna fix all our problems. Oh, okay, here's all the money to pay for everything. Go ahead and and run with it. No, it's a. Uh, it's funny. The deciding factor was my chief sitting in one of Ike's lectures at a conference, and he was talking about smooth bores. And we left the the conference uh, uh, conference that day. Uh, went out to eat, uh, eat in the evening. You know, sitting there uh, stewing over a beer. And he goes, "I'm going to tell you what. Right now, I'm done with this. We're not going to play around anymore. What I want you to do when we get back, is send me an email saying, you know, our nozzles are outdated. For me now, it's a safety factor. So." I want a combination of everything. No, I don't want everything smooth bore, which I was 100% on. There's a place for both nozzles. You know, I like a smooth bore for a structural firefight, right? Interior. Correct. A car fire, I don't want one, you know, yeah. and that's just me. I don't like pistol grips. We still have a pistol grip on our engine. And you know what? For me, I'm probably going to use that on a car fire also because I'm short. If I get a taller vehicle and I have to get the engine compartment, I gooseneck it. You know what I mean? But for a structure, I want a smooth bore. The science has changed. It's not the small droplets of water that we were sold on, you know, years ago. It's now the larger droplets of water. And I tell people all the time, the science is there whether you like it or not. You just got to do your homework and read it, you know? Yeah. I mean, we keep a pistol grip every now and then because the cops need heroes too. And sometimes we let them flow some water. Oh, for sure. For sure. I feel more comfortable with the pistol grip. (laughs) 100%. Oh, man, I love it. We've been talking a little bit about uh, fanboying, right, on some of these people that have, we've we've had impact on. Actually, mm-hmm. you know what? Before I talk about that, I'm not going to forget about the fact that you said you had your chief in Pensacola or listening to Chief Ike. Was that in Pensacola or did no, Chief Ike No, it was actually, it was either Firehouse or FDIC. My chief goes okay. to all the big ones, uh, FDIC every year. Okay. And then um, he was going to Firehouse before they stopped. Uh, okay, so mad respect for your chief. Because what Justin McWilliams talked about on the scrap, he's like, we got to get the decision makers in the room. Yeah. Right. It's one thing to have a bunch of firefighters in there and motivate them and, and, and inspire. But mm-hmm. if you don't have the decision makers in the room, you can't make that much of an impact in your department. Otherwise, you're fighting a two year battle. So yeah. hats off to your chief for being at least at FDIC, because I've even trying to get I've tried to get every single chief. Uh, to come out to a con- I even ask them what conferences are you going to next year? Because I want to go mm-hmm. with you because I want to be. Right, right there with them, be like, hey, Chief, this is Corley Moore. This is Todd Edwards. You know what I mean? Because I have, I don't think Todd knows me, but I mean, Corley obviously is, mm-hmm. I made him be my mentor. So he knows who I am. He's been on the podcast. I love it. <laughs> okay. So now I was going to talk about like the, the fanboying or I, I, it's, it's, it's real. It's, it's fanboy. Oh, yeah. Like I've fucking, 
Corley, Scott Thompson, Kyle Romagus, those are three of my favorite right yep. off the top. And I don't even have to think about it. But uh, you specifically sent me the topic, Corley. Yeah. When I asked yep. you about topics. So, I mean, we touched on them a little bit, but like what kind of impact has, has that made? Like the vigilantes, the scrap, all of it. Like how it's has huge. that helped you? It's huge, man. I got to go out how I met him, not only just, you know, through messaging, through, you know, social media, but physically met him. So some years ago, my kid, when my youngest son was in elementary school, on my days off, I'm driving him to school and I'm picking him up. And I'm listening to all these podcasts. And he knew two voices by name after a couple months. Aaron Heller from uh, New Jersey On-Scene Training Associates and Corley Moore. So he would always ask, you know, who are we listening to today? X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 blah. So one day I come home. He comes running down the hallway in the house. And he goes, hey, uh, you're going to be on the scrap. I said, okay, like, whatever. <laughs> and he goes, no, I'm serious. He's like, I messaged Corley. And I asked, you know, that you be on the scrap. And I'm like, you're kidding. He's like, no, I'm serious. He, he, and he didn't have a phone at the time. He had a, what do you call it? Not an iPad. Um, this Kindle fires or something like that. Something, whatever it was. It was and fire. he shows me the message. I'm like, oh my God. So I grab my phone. I'm like, I am so sorry. You know, I, I didn't know. He's like, dude, it's so cool that your son looks up to you like that. I'll have you on the show. Okay. So I know he's being polite. That's cool. I'm not going to be on the show. I don't want to be on the show. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm nobody from nowhere. So, Again, we fast forward, you know, we, we still message each other, you know, great show, talk about tactics, you know, whatever it might be, just quickly here and there, because I know he's busy. So I'm at a job site one day, and he texts me and says, hey, what are you doing tonight? And I said, baseball or something like that? Not thinking anything. He's, all right, never mind. Never mind what? He said, well, I had a cancellation I was going to have you on. And I'm like, oh, no, I do. Like, no. You know, he's like, your family's more important. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Fast forward, you know, sometime later, it's a Friday or Saturday night, you know, we got a ball game on, and... He's uh, sent me a message like, hey, what are you doing on this date? I'm not thinking anything of it. He goes, penciling you in for, for this date. I'm like, you got to be kidding. He's like, nope. He's like, you're going to be on. I'm like, holy shit, okay. man. So long story short is my kid actually got me on the show. So I'm on the show. Uh, fast forward to the next August. You know, we're in Pensacola and Corley was there. And, you know, the family's there and we're in the uh, the lobby area. You know, everyone's got the shirt off, you know, drinking at a good time, um, you know, coming in from the beach. And Cam goes, Hey, there's Corley. So I'm like, where? And then you hear, what's up, Cam? He's like, what's up, Corley? That was a great I, Corley experience. It was hilarious, man. And even like later in the week when we were in class, they passed each other. Same thing, right? And my wife's like, who the hell is calling your name? <laughs> and he's like, that's Corley Moore. You don't know that? She's like, who? <laughs> See, I've never seen him before. She thought some stranger was yelling his name, but. Oh, but yeah, man, but everything, you know, that, that he puts out there, and, you know, he's got these great, uh, you know, uh, these guests on, uh, big names and no names, and his Rolodex, who wouldn't want his Rolodex, you know what I mean? Yeah. And motivational. Um, I tease, you know, Robert Ramirez has been on, you know, quite a bit, and uh, Chief Thompson, you know, the America's Fire Chief, right? I mean, who, yes. would, who would not want to work for him? I mean, all the, his book is phenomenal. His lectures yeah. are phenomenal, you know, but. Yeah, man. Every time yeah, it's right scrap. up here, it's right behind me. Functional oh, yeah. Fire. There you go. Yep, yeah, I see it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, but every time I get a chance, and, and I'm old, you know, I'm almost fifty. So when he has a scrap sign at nine o'clock my time, you know, I get about three and a half minutes into it, and then I'm out. Like I'm, yeah. I'm passed out. So I catch up on him, you know, typically at work or like on job sites and stuff like that, and that's why you don't see me really in a vigilante hangout because I can't stay up till. <laughs> Yeah, I used to make every single one, man, and uh, now that my baby is uh, aware of things, you know, when she was just a baby, she slept all the time, so that I yeah. could just throw on the scrap. Yeah. Uh, but nowadays, I, I can hardly make a live either, man. It sucks. But, you know, he knows. Corley knows oh, yeah. the, the diehards, whether you make the lives or not. I mean, that's the one thing I love about Corley is uh, he will give the time and attention to anybody that's uh, willing to... Yeah, you know, shoot the shit, you know, and yep. he's he's one of the most humble dudes. And he even said on my podcast when he came on, he's like, I still don't understand why people want to even talk to me yeah, or have me sign their book, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, but that's what makes you you, dude, you know, yeah, you know, so uh, love him. And we talked about it, too, is the imposter syndrome of people being like, I can't start a podcast. I'm a nobody or I'm not from FDNY or something like that. And they're like, but we talk about Corley Moore being a superstar in the fire service, but the He's a BC for a suburban fire department with right. three or four stations, uh -huh. you know, not much different than myself, 
or yep. you, I don't think. Nope. Nope. You know, but he is willing to overcome that. Even he, but he even says I'm the luckiest guy in the fire service. Yeah. He has humility, but he also has ambition. He, he's, he's able to, to silence the critics and the haters yep. and just continue to do his thing. And, uh, that's why he's such a, he's such a bright light for the fire service. Today. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, don't sell yourself short, my man, uh, you and, you know, tailboard and, you know, a couple others, man, you guys are doing great work. And again, it's guys like you, like I said at the beginning, that motivate guys like me to be re-energized at times. So this, you know, we all go through our slumps. You know what I mean? We, we all go through our slump. Um, a while back I, I, I hit one and I just was miserable at work. You know what I mean? I just wanted the shift to be over. And, you know, I start listening to this and a couple others, man, it, it just motivates you again. And it's just yeah, like tomorrow I'm back on. I can't wait. I can't, I just can't wait to get back to work. Man, that's all. That's a good feeling though, isn't it? It is. It really you is. You want to go into work and you're like, man, I cannot wait for whatever, just, just yep. to get into work and, and be around people. Yep. I, I went through that truck, phase. Man. I went through that phase too. And I think Brian LaFleur, LaFleur talked about it when he was on is like, you're going to mm-hmm. hit that, uh, you're going to hit that seven year slump or something like that. Yep. And, uh, if you don't, if you don't be careful, that's when people leave the department is around that time. You know, I think they, other people too, when they hit a slump, you know, they, they get so frustrated with the inner workings of the department or what one ship might be doing or not, or administration, you know, um, I hate the fact that for a long time, and I know guys in my department and my shift specifically still feel like a number. And I tell them all the time, we're going to control what we can control. And that's going to be specifically to our ship. And maybe admin, town hall, if you want to call it that city hall, maybe they consider you a number. Now, it is what it is. You're a person to me, hands down. Like I was saying mm-hmm. earlier, that's why I make it a point when I see them, how's the family? How's your day? You know, how's Connor? How's Andrew? How's Chloe? Audrey? Luke? Nicholas, everyone I can think of that has kids, I try and be personable because I never received it. And it drives me nuts that, you know, uh, uh, someone with, with rank and a certain bugles or, you know, colored shirt, you know, can't sit there and just take five minutes some days and say, hey, how's the family? You know, how was baseball today? How's your daughter doing? Is she walking yet? No, is she crying? Is she sleeping through the night? Is she driving you nuts? <laughs> you know, do you have to lock all the doors? You know what I mean? Uh, do you leave the basement door open if you guys have basement? Do you leave the basement door open? You know, that type of thing. You know, we're, we're people too. And then we have to start treating people, I, I think, a lot better, A, if we want to retain them. Because uh, I don't know how it is in Colorado, but I can tell you here in Michigan, there's a huge shortage of firefighters. And a ton of departments in the area here in South East, Southeast Michigan are doing laterals. You know, if you have a few years on the job, you'll come over with your pay. We'll put you through medic. You know, all that stuff. I mean, we could potentially lose some people. Why? We got to do better, you know, uh, being ourselves and and treating them right. If you treat them right, you know what I mean? And you let them be a part of conversation and maybe some decisions, you know, you're going to have a positive environment. But when you walk by somebody, you can't say hello or you can't ask them how their day was, you know, or you can't say, hey, what do you think about this? It's going to drive people down that don't want to be there. It drives me absolutely insane when I see it. So again, I'm not perfect by any means, but I try to be the best leader that I can be as the shift boss, you know what I mean? And keep my people motivated. And I ask them to be involved in certain conversations, you know, and I ask them to do certain things or, hey, how would you handle this situation if you were me? And it really does create a positive environment. I really think you hit the nail on the head, though, with with talking about building relationships and understanding about people's family dynamics, Mm -hmm. right, is a... you, you, you humanize the employee, you humanize yep. the firefighter. If we continue to treat, if we were to treat each other like employees at freaking Starbucks, right. I'm just here until I punch out and then I go home and I go live my own life. Right. But we spend a third of our lives with one another. Mm-hmm. You know, I may not like the quirks or the way you cook your chicken or something like that. <laughs> and if, if we, if we maintain superficial relationships like that, that's, that sucks, right? But when we're getting in deep and getting to know each other and like, hey, Preston, I know you got a 13-year-old baby and she was in the NICU for two months, born at two and a half pounds. Man, that's got to be tough and stressful. What's your family dynamic like? Oh, right. I can't believe you're able to come into work and perform right? and still manage your household. Like, tell me about that. And then also for, from a battalion chief or whatever perspective, sending me into a fire and knowing that I have a wife and kid at home and the yeah. decisions you make are going to impact whether I come out of that fire or not. Yep. 
Man, we're that that's that's why guys are leaving departments because if they don't have someone that gives a shit about them, right? And all we're doing is running calls and making money for the chief so they can build the station to put their name on it, right? I don't want to be a part of that organization, I want to be a family member. Yep, I tell my people all the time, I care, I care for you. This is why I'm making decisions that I have to make because I care for you. And at the end of the day, it's my responsibility that you go home to your family. That's a huge responsibility when you get put in this, you know, in this situation. You can take all the classes you want and all the leadership programs, read books and articles and talk to people. But once you're put in that spot, when you're, you know, sitting on the porch or, or the sidewalk or the front lawn saying, go take care of things. And you're looking at a structure going, shit, ma'am, am I doing the right thing? Would I go in there? And I will never put my people into a position that I won't. And I'm aggressive. I've always been aggressive. It's very aggressive. Mm-hmm. I remember walking out of a lot of fires, being told to walk out of a lot of fires like a kid. You know what I mean? I'm kicking the ground. I'm throwing down the nozzle because <laughs> I could have got it, right? Yeah. They see things on the outside that I don't see. You know what I mean? That's where that teamwork is. But more important, like I said, you, you, you take care of your people. They're going to take care of you. Guys look, make, a lot of my guys make me look like a fucking rock star. I make a lot of mistakes. But these guys always pick me up somehow. And that's what I love about them. And I will go to the moon and back. I tell them all the time, if you are making the right decision in your question, I will back you 100%. If you make a shit decision, there's nothing I can do. If you make a terrible decision, I can't help you. Especially if you lie about it. If you're not upfront and honest when you make a mistake, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go sideways for you, man. But if you're making the right decisions in your question, 100%, I will always be, be behind you and back you up. Yeah, that's, I love that last message too. My battalion chief, and I think I spoke about this before, but he comes up to me and he'll be like, why'd you make the decision? It could have been a bad decision. It could have been a good decision. But he goes, why'd you make the decision? I'm like, you know what, chief? Man, I saw this from this angle. The smoke looked like this. So I thought we can head it off from here. And he's like, okay. But if, you, if he asked you, why'd you make the decision? And you're like, fuck, I don't know, chief. I was just going through the motions. He'd be like, right. now we have a problem. Yeah. Now we have a problem because you're making decisions that impact everyone else and the fire ground and you can't tell me why you made the decision. Now we have a problem. Exactly. And I, I like that. I, I truly like that. I might adopt that as, hey, why did you do that? Not to criticize, but maybe you saw something I didn't. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. To Just to open up conversation because tactics are always different. Everybody interprets things a little bit differently and that's okay. You know, let's have a conversation. Ultimately, you know, I'm still responsible, but I like that aspect that he has of asking somebody why you did something like that. I think I want to borrow that. Yeah, you know, it's definitely not mine. I, that's the same thing. I want to try to borrow it too. But luckily for me, I'm not wearing any bugles, so I don't have to do any of that crap. Yeah, I tell everybody in our department uh, with our rank structure, I said, don't go past lieutenant. Just don't. Just get there, sit there, and don't move. Man, it, it's, that, the headaches are terrible, man. But th- I was just talking to Michael Ramirez about this. It's like trying to get these passionate heart-filled firefighters that understand the brotherhood and, and the why of everything and, and mm-hmm. are students of the game, trying to convince them to go into those positions of the decision maker. Yeah. And they're like, no, nah, no, I'm yeah. not doing that. I don't want to do it. But then we, that's how we end up getting the wrong people in uh, those spots. Well, it's funny because when our, our positions came up, I was not going to promote or I wasn't going to test. My career dream at that time was to just sit on an engine as a lieutenant and you know that was it and my good friend chris we go you know uh, cft together every year he looks at me one day we're having a beer and he goes do you think that you can work for some of these guys and like a promoter over you and i'm like mm. uh, probably not and here i am you know in that position now so yeah. it was a tough decision but you know again it's everything's perspective you know what i mean you can go in with a plan for the day and within the first three and a half minutes it's out the window because something might pop up, DC calls for this, you know what I mean? Runs, as yeah. you said, you can leave the firehouse at 7.30 in the morning. It might not be back till midnight, you know? It's just one of those things. Yeah. But you know what What I think would help is, because um, you're in training, uh-huh. and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you are teaching and you see the younger generation just getting after it and, and uh, giving it 110%, you feel like the fire service is in a good place, right? Yep. A lot of times, not every time, but like watching these people develop under your tutelage. I, you know, one guy I got to call out, his name's Mike Risk. He's your Marcos. You know, he's, he's huge. He's so into the, you know, so into the job. He goes to all these different training, physical and, you know, classroom and everything like that. Uh, one of our neighboring communities the other week had a writ scenario and he had to find people to go. We were on duty, so we couldn't go. 
and he was calling like literally everybody on the roster saying, hey, they're offering this training. I really want to go. Uh, he ended up finding two guys. They originally wanted four people on the engine. They were able to get three. Uh, the uh, training officer, training chief of the neighboring department said, that's fine. Uh, I get a text later that night when they got back. The guys did great. Risk is a beast. Like, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. This guy is just is awesome. And when I when you said that, I, I, I think of him right away. Mm. The future is bright. I think he's early 30s, if that. A couple okay. kids and, and just, like I said, a monster that just absolutely loves the job and loves to talk about the job, you know, working, everything like that. So hopefully one day I'll get him on my shift. Yeah, right. I, I love I love watching BCs and stuff fight for guys or try to bargain or or something like that. Like, I'll give you these two guys for this one guy. No, not going to happen. All right. No, but I think what I was touching on with that, it was like these young guys that are getting after it and they're, they're eating everything up, getting them to start teaching early, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, I, I want you to mentor this rookie here yep. because I think once they start embracing the teacher role, mm -hmm. they understand how valuable that is. And then as they progress throughout their career and they've been teaching, instructing, they're like, okay, I don't have to be the guy all the time. Correct. I can teach, I can teach people. I've been teaching for a while. I can teach mm -hmm. people to, to, to carry on or pass the torch to them. And then maybe they feel comfortable in promoting into those spots. I don't know what the secret Absolutely. is. Absolutely. I've told a couple of guys, you know, you don't, you get into training, you don't have to be the master of everything. You're not going to be the master of everything. Pick a topic that you like, whether it's forcible entry, search, you know, ladders. Like we have a, we have a truck. We don't have a truck. You know what I mean? We don't have a truck culture. It, it's yeah. supposed to go on fire as well. If we're out because we have another rig for a primary response, guess what? The truck doesn't pull out fires. You know, but if you love the truck, you love the ladders, you love the searching, you know, forcible entry, pick a topic or two, you know what I mean? And start with that. And you start teaching, like you said, not only the department, but specifically the guys that are, you know, uh, don't have a lot of experience, or whether it's years or just, you know, don't have a lot of experience in the fire service, by all means, man, take them under your wing, show them the ropes, show them different options of doing things. And like I said, you hit that base hit, man, every now and then you're going to, you're going to hit a double and it's going to spread like wildfire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it's really cool thinking about teaching other people stuff that you've either learned on your own or was passed down to you mm -hmm. by keeping the keeping that tradition and legacy going. Yeah. And guys maybe doing something now in the fire service that they that someone else learned 50 years ago. Oh yeah. And it's it's continued to be passed down and that I think that's where a lot of tradition and legacy exists in the fire service, right? You may not know the name of the guy. Like not everybody knows where the Halligan bar came from, right? But we use them all right. the time. Right? right. And you can dive deep into all that stuff, but it's, it's, it's just, I think that's, that's an extremely valuable thing that not a lot of, uh, into the job firemen actually think about, right. They, right. Like they, they just want to be the guys that go force the doors and kiss the ladies and save the babies. Right. Like, right. Exactly. It, exactly. But you got to look at the long term. long term. Those legacy. are truck guys, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, and to quote the quote, the highwayman and Rob Fisher, Truck culture is a mindset. It's not an apparatus. It's not right, tools. Right. That's, that's what they were saying. They were at the Mile High Fire Conference, and and I like we were cutting holes in roofs and on pitch roofs and flat roofs. And I'm like, I don't know if I'll ever do this because our our department doesn't have a truck culture. We have yeah. we have one quint, and they were like, yeah. No, man, it's it's a mindset because you can be an engine company on a roof cutting a hole in a roof. You know, yep. you don't have to be a truck. So I'll tell you, one of the best truck guys I've ever met, and it was through Great Lakes Hot, is. Um, Arthur Ashley out of uh, uh, Kentucky. Mm. He's what, part of the and, highwayman. The boy, and what, first of all, what a true gentleman. He, he, the guy is just phenomenal. And, you know, he's got that program that, oh, God, it's, uh, it's still soon now. Um, truck work with an engine or something like that. And I, I, I know I butchered the name of it, but because um, that's how we work. You know, that's how we operate. You know, we're going to send somebody to the roof. We never send anybody to the roof. But if we send somebody <laughs> to the roof, it's going to be someone from an engine before the truck gets there, typically. You know what I mean? Again, mm. we don't have those designated responses because of the way we operate uh but yeah man one of the best truck guys i've ever met in my life arthur ashley yes i've met him a couple times now i met him in wichita and i met him at mile high mm -hmm. and i i messaged him after he, he was on the scrap because i thought he killed the scrap oh hell yeah and uh so i've gotten a chance to meet him i hopefully get can convince him into coming on the podcast next year because mm -hmm. i'm booked all the way out for the rest of the year which is good crazy for you. to me yeah crazy i may pick your brain though because i might slow it down instead of from one week to like twice a week or something yeah because my brain hurts but uh, on. i get it yeah hopefully i can get arthur ashley on uh on next year because he's yeah he's cool he's got some awesome stories his storytelling ability though is pretty solid 
you know, just his instructional uh, at Great Lakes Hot uh, year two, because the first two years we hosted everything within our department. And then hats off to Sean Duffy. I got to give him a, a shout out, you know, for organizing the entire thing. Uh, without him, this doesn't happen. But year two was at my facility. Uh, and since then, we've just outgrown it, you know. And Sean is a, a, a great guy. He lets me be this part, he this much part of it, you know. Uh, but there were people that were very uncomfortable with saws, and they had a roof prop at the time that they brought out. And he would take the time with everybody that you could see was a little bit uncomfortable, again, with the saw or maybe on a pitch or something like that. So it wasn't like you quickly went through that rotation. He wouldn't let you leave until he felt that he was comfortable with you being in the position that you were in. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Well, it was awesome to see. And me standing on the ground kind of watching that, I'm like, man, this is just one of those guys that just gets it. 100% just gets it. Now, if you say my name to him, he's not going to know who the hell I am. Sure. But he's made an impact on me in such a positive way. Uh, when we talk about truck, you know, maybe with our funds here, you know, in Michigan, he's one of the guys that reached out to and said, hey, can you rent a class? Because I would really like to have, you know, you in the catalog. So if we wanted to bring in somebody about truck work, because we don't have anybody, you know, in the area that does truck work, we could bring you in. But yeah, yeah. man, he's just a stand-up guy. Yeah, he's definitely a guy I have not had the opportunity of networking with. Uh, I did, like, what, two years ago, I was just messaging him on Facebook because I was going through the burnout phase of F my department. I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. And I, he switched departments. So I was like picking his brain on like, when do you know to, to yeah. leave? You know? I was talking to him, guys like John Spira. Mm -hmm. um, what's his name out of Carolina Fire Days? Joe, I forget his last uh, name. Yeller. Joe Yeller. I was, I was yep. like talking to these dudes. And I've never met. They have a huge hold on the fire service, right? The impacts yeah. that they're making, right? And yep. uh, some like random ass firefighter. Hey, when do you know when to quit your department? God, some I was such a dumb ass back then. I still am, but learning curves, you know, my man. Learning curves. But honestly, they all replied back to me, yeah. and and they gave me little pieces of advice, and it was all different, and it was great because I I'm still at my current department, which I think is was the best choice. Good. I was just going through some shit. Yep, as we all do, yeah. you know. And it's nice to reach out to people, and like we said before. I've reached out to a lot of people over the years, and I've gotten responses from some great people that I still network with today, and I never got responses from other people, and that's okay. You know, uh, but for the ones that, that have influenced me, uh, you know, personally and professionally, I thank them very much. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I, and I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for those people as well, mm -hmm. just replying back, you know, yeah. and uh, that's why I tell people, and I've said it before on this podcast and others, like, when, it, when someone, when a guest puts out his or her contact information, use it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, Candace Ashby. I, and I was just having random conversations with her on Facebook messenger and Dina Ali mm -hmm. just talking to her about mental health. Never met her, you know, I just, just because, just because right. I know that I can get great information off of, off of them and, uh, yeah. and the impact that they're making. So I always encourage people like go to the lectures, network with the instructors there. And then right. when anybody gives their contact information out, reach out because i mean and plus we're all looking for feedback right mm -hmm. like if someone if someone messaged me and they're like dude i hate the intro of your podcast i'm like cool and i'm gonna start looking into someone to, to help make me another intro you know i don't care mm -hmm. like i'm trying to i'm trying to get better dude like if but if you say something like something's wrong with your face i can only do so much about <laughs> my face you know <laughs> can't That's wear a mask because I'm, I'm so short it makes me look taller yeah, right. You need one of those barber chairs. You just like push the the stool up and you just raise up. Dude, I, over the year, nothing's sacred in the firehouse, right? And not to digress, but I can't tell you how many times I, I've come in, opened my door for my right seat or when I was, you know, in the back and there's a a, a child seat. Yeah. <sighs> one of the guys, yep. my old partner, loved him to death, biggest smart ass in the world. His daughter outgrew a um a little step stool for the uh, the bathroom. So I come into work one day and the step stool is in front of my gear locker. Yeah. I'm Man, like, who put this the... here? And he's just sitting there laughing. I'm like, you motherfuckers. Yep, I've seen that a time or two. I've even yep. seen for the engineers, they like, uh, well, uh, like, like tape chocks to the brake or something like that, or breaking the gas, like little blocks. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's, it's brutal. Man, firefighters uh, are the biggest assholes oh, yeah. in the oh, world. Oh, absolutely. But we love them. We oh, love absolutely. them. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Well, all right, brother, we're coming up on an hour and a half. Um, we didn't get to touch on every topic, but that just means that, you know, we'll just have to do something live at Great Lakes Hot or something like that. Anytime you let me know, man. 
All right. Just come out. If, you, if you ever get a chance, please let me know. It is on it my is, bucket list. It is on my bucket list to get out there. So I'll, I'll hit you up. It's awesome. This shirt's going to be really great. Uh, Sean has is, got a great uh, Rolodex, you know what I mean? And he's got some great speakers coming back. I'm blessed I will be with uh, at my tower with Todd Edwards and his crew. Again, um, got to give a shout out to Steve Robertson, uh, who's another good friend of mine, a big, big influential person in my life, uh, professionally and personally. Even though he and Todd are Buckeyes, you know, I look past that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just I, I had to I had to throw that in there real quick. Well, hell yeah, uh, great shout out. And uh, for final thoughts for for the listeners, man, like, do you, what close us out? Like, what's your message for final thoughts? I, I would have to say, you know, kind of touching or building on what you said, it, don't be afraid to ask a question. Don't be afraid to reach out. If you see a podcast, read an article, you're at a training event, something of that nature, and one of the instructors or participants or whoever, you know, it's caught your attention for whatever reason, don't hesitate to reach out. Ask the question. Take the picture. You know what I mean? I'm terrible mm -hmm. at that. Even when you're like, hey, send these pictures. Like, I had my wife pick them up. Um, but take the time. Be a student of the game. You know, the biggest thing. Learn to love the job. Because if you love the job, never work a day in your life. Mm. And the job will love you back. It will. Or it's going to yeah. kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, oh, man. I, I thank Sorry, you so I much for closing. There. Yeah, no, so, dude. I love the job, man. I, I, I truly do. And uh, it took a long time for me to, you know, find that happy medium where I, I got to break. You know, and for us, it was, again, sports in our family, baseball specifically. You know what I mean? I can break away, go to baseball, watch Michigan football, something of that, you know, nature. But yeah, be a student of the game, love the job, man, and, you know, never give up, have fun. Beautiful. Way to close this out. If uh, if people want to get a hold of you, how can they do that? Oh, uh, you can find me on social media. Uh, Facebook is uh, Steve Stowacki, and uh, Instagram is Stewie something, I don't know, 58, I think. It's my I know, you number. need to change that, dude. You got, like, weird. <laughs> Your Instagram's weird. Yeah. Yeah. If you need help on uh, on Instagramming and content creation, I'm a much better Instagram firefighter than I am an actual firefighter. So it's there so easy to look good on Instagram, I'll tell you. Hell yeah. um, all right, brother. Hey, that'll wrap us up. Thank you, everybody, for uh, listening in, tuning again. That'll wrap up episode 36. Once again, if you find found value in the show, you want to support Stewie and you found and you you resonated with a lot of topics you talk about reach out reach out to reach out to stewie give us a comment give us a like subscribe share all that fun stuff because this is all operated off a of word of mouth i'm too cheap uh, uh to pay for ads and all that crap because i'm already in the hole so um all right that'll that'll be it i'll catch you all next week see ya